people joining here. Thank you for coming. Um, so yeah, I'm going to uh, talk today about um, continuous delivery the hard way with uh, with Kubernetes. And um, the reason that I call it continuous delivery the hard way um, is that we are going to uh, start with um, a, a, a simple implementation of continuous delivery with Kubernetes. And then we're going to make it increasingly complicated. But every time we make it more complicated, I'm, I'm going to explain why we're making it more complicated, um, what the limitations of each of the um, of the previous design were, and why we're adding more complexity in order to in order to make it better. Um, and um, and and so uh, with that, let's let's take a look at at the agenda. Um, the first item uh, on the agenda is just to talk a little bit about about why you should do continuous delivery. Um, I'm then going to give you just enough information about uh, Kubernetes um, to understand the examples that we're going to look at. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, about about GitLab, um, and then I'm going to start sort of iterating on. Um, on the designs, that, and we're going to sort of build up this architecture together. Um, so um, then we'll look at some conclusions, and and hopefully I will have some uh, some some demos. Um, although I'm just talking to my colleague who uh, works on the Catacoder environments that we use for the demos, and he's saying that there's a problem with them. Um, so I may have to skip the demo bits, which would be unfortunate. Um, but I'll give them a go, uh, and if they don't work, then we can just say that I didn't sacrifice enough to the demo gods. So uh, apologies in advance if we if we hit road bumps there. Um, so um, I just want to say this is one way to do it. Um, this is not the the only way that you can do continuous delivery. What I'm going to show you, it's just the way that works for us. And so at Weaveworks, um, the um, the approach that we use for, for continuously delivering our software to a production cluster on a production Kubernetes cluster on Amazon is um, it's something that we've been developing over the course of about two years. It's something that uh, we've iterated on ourselves, um, and it's something that we've managed to get working pretty well. So, so hopefully, a lot of the sort of um, uh, a lot of the advice and the wisdom in uh, in this approach. Sort of is 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 proven by uh, by the real world experience that the the um, production team here at at Weaveworks have for operating Weave Cloud itself, which is our product uh, on Kubernetes on Amazon. So cool. Um, so with that said, uh, uh, let me just talk for a second about um, why you should do continuous delivery. Um, so um, the this comes back to the fact that more and more people are doing microservices. So more and more people are uh, breaking their applications up into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, they are uh, sort of reorganizing companies as well around this idea of microservices. So um, Adrian Cockcroft famous, famously says that microservices is a reorg. It really is. It's about um, this idea of well, some people say two pizza teams. If you can't feed your entire team with two pizzas for a given microservice, then um, then the team is too big, or the pizzas are too small, or something. Um, and then um, Conway's law sort of feeds into that idea. It's this idea that um, uh, that the structure of your software will reflect the structure of your team. Um, and this is absolutely true. If you have one big monolithic team building a software product, then you are probably going to end up with one big monolithic software product. And uh, the bigger a software project gets, um, the, the more it slows down. It's kind of exponentially bad. Um, and so this whole microservices movement is, is really all about scaling, uh, scaling a project or a product. Um, and it's a way of scaling a team by by breaking a large team down into smaller pieces and making each uh, making each individual team responsible for just uh, for just doing one thing well. For example, they might have uh, they might be responsible for uh, the user's service in their microservices architecture, and it's their job to make sure the user's service works really well. Um, and sort of related to this idea um, is the idea that. Um, 
if you have um, if if you have a it, it, it's this idea of how fast can you make changes. So if you have um, even if you have a microservices architecture, but you you only release changes to each service once a month, or something like that, or once a quarter. Um, uh, and especially, this is especially bad if you if you have a sort of a monolith, a monolithic approach um, to to your architecture. Then you end up um, in this situation where um, releases are scary, like and release day is stressful. And um, if that's the case, and and the reason that it's scary and stressful is that change is hard, and the more change you try and make at the same time, the harder it is. Um, to uh, to be comfortable that it's going to work when you make the changes, and so the the argument for continuous delivery in the context of all of this microservices and DevOps stuff I was talking about is if you can just make it completely boring and and ordinary that you're releasing changes to your software, and if you can do it multiple times a day, then suddenly making changes doesn't become special, and it means it means that fewer changes ever get batched up. And so, in this way, you can uh, you can continuously deliver. You can continuously make changes to your software, um, especially if they are broken up into microservices, um, and you can achieve better velocity and better efficiency as a software team um, if if you do that. Uh, so, if anyone has any questions, by the way, just throw them in the chat, and I'll uh, get to them when I can, maybe at the end, or maybe if there's a, a sensible place to pause. Cool. Um, so I'm just going to change gears slightly um, and um, talk about all you need to know with Q all you need to know about Kubernetes on one slide. Um, so I'm just going to use uh, this because um, I'm just going to go over this because there are going to be some uh, Kubernetes manifests that are used later on in the talk. Um, and if uh, you don't know what they are, then it makes it harder to follow. Um, so just really, really quickly, uh, Kubernetes is a container orchestration framework uh, that uses Docker containers, typically. Um, and it allows you to schedule those containers across multiple nodes in a cluster. So really, in this diagram here, we have containers in the middle. They're the most fundamental component of, of Kubernetes. Um, containers, um, probably everyone knows, they're Docker container images. Uh, a Docker container contains your excuse me, application code in an isolated environment. Um, containers get grouped into pods. Um, a pod is a set of containers that share a network namespace, um, and they share local volumes. Um, those pods get uh, co-scheduled on a machine, so they're always running in the same place. Sorry, the containers in a pod are always running in the same place. Pods are mortal, which means if a machine fails, uh, then that pod isn't coming back. The pod that was running on that machine won't be coming back. Um, uh, pods have a pod IP address on a network, and they also have labels. And then a deployment is how you scale pods across multiple machines and how you can scale them up and down with multiple replicas. Uh, and Kubernetes, you can say, I want there to be 10 copies of this pod in a deployment, and Kubernetes will make sure that there are 10 of them by reconciling the actual state of the cluster against the desired state. Um, and then services are just how you name things. Um, uh, they get virtual IPs, there's cluster IPs for internal things and node ports for external things. Um, and you route between services and pods based on uh, label selectors, which are basically like search queries. So the, the, the service can be like, um, I want to route traffic to pods which match app equals nginx. And then um, the pods can be labeled app equals nginx, and that's how the service will figure out where to route that traffic. OK, um, I'm also going to use GitLab in this example. Um, so, um, so GitLab uh, contains a number of things. Uh, I just use GitLab as an example because it conveniently bundles up all three of these things in, in one product. Uh, but you can also uh, apply everything I show you today across any other CI system, any other Docker registry, and any other version control system you like, GitHub, Travis Circle, blah, blah, blah. Um, None of this that I'm going to show you is, is specific, really, to any one of those kinds of systems. Um, cool. OK, so um, these are the things we've got. These are the things I've talked about so far. Uh, these are the bits that we need to try and glue together somehow um, in order to make a functioning continuous delivery pipeline. 
Um, by the way, what I mean by a continuous delivery pipeline is that I want to be able to make a change to some code and have that uh, code change tested and then automatically deployed to production. And the idea with this is that if, if you just make every change, as, as it, well, every change that gets merged to master at least, if you just make every change that gets merged to master uh, get rolled out into your staging cluster or even your, your production cluster, if you're feeling pretty brave, um, then, um, then that really does make releases very boring. They're happening all the time. That's just, oh, I merged another commit into master. So that sort of goes to my earlier point um, of increasing velocity by, by making releases less special. Um, so we've got, a, we've got a version control system here. Like like Git uh, GitLab's version like Git based version control system or GitHub or something, we've got a CI system and the CI system's job of course is to take changes to code and turn them into container images and push those container images into a Docker registry. Um, then you've got the Docker registry that's where you store these artifacts um, that have like a specific version of your application that got built and tested, and it's the same artifact that got tested that will then get deployed into production, and that's why Docker is so so useful. Um, and then we have our Kubernetes cluster, which is where we want to run this stuff. Um, so uh, Kubernetes will need to pull these images from this Docker registry somehow. So um, we've got all these pieces, um, and we need to figure out sort of how how do we wire them up. So um, the the next thing I'm going to show you is what all the different interfaces are on these pieces. Um, so the version control system, of course, uh, uses uh, Git as its API. The CI system is effectively a glorified way of saying, when there's a change to this Git thing, run these shell commands on it. Um, then we've got the Docker registry, uh, which of course speaks the Docker registry API, which is the, um, the API that was developed at Docker. Um, and then there's the Kubernetes API, which of course is a different API, which was developed by the Kubernetes team for doing things like saying, make me a deployment with this many pods in it, and inside those pods use these container images. Um, and so I kind of feel like, given all of these different uh, things and their interfaces, I feel a bit like this guy. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen Apollo 13. I, I think it's a great film. It's one of my favorites. Um, and at one point in Apollo 13, so the astronauts are up in, up in space. And uh, one of the, um, uh, there's an explosion. And uh, they need to try and uh, figure out um, how to uh, how to how to stop the air filling with carbon dioxide as as the astronauts are breathing it, and they realize oh we've only got we literally have uh, to fit a uh, round peg into a square hole because we've got this um, uh, we've got this this round peg um, uh, CO two filter and we need to fit it into the hole for this uh, CO two um, uh, filtration system that that takes the takes the square ones. And of course, the solution to this is that they use duct tape, uh, because duct tape is how you solve most problems in space. And uh, duct tape is also kind of how uh, the first proposal that I'm going to bring forwards here will feel, because um, it kind of string and gluing things together. But so let's just try and do the MVP version of our continuous delivery pipeline, the, the minimum viable continuous delivery pipeline. Um, and what we can do is we can have, um, we can say, okay, well, to begin with, minimum viable is that the first time you deploy uh, your service, uh, you have to do it manually. And that's fine. You only deploy new services once, and then you update them after that. So that's not too bad. So we're going to say you manually do a kubectl apply uh, to create a Kubernetes cluster. Um, then, um, okay, so how are we going to deploy uh, an update? Um, the simplest possible way of joining these things together, I think, as far as I can tell, is um, is basically like this. So, uh, if there's a code change, um, then the version control, then a developer has done a git push, and it causes a code change in the version control system. Uh, this would result in the CI system uh, doing a new build um, and creating a Docker image as an artifact from that code change. Uh, Docker, um, the CI system then also does a Docker push. I mean, remember, the CI system is just a glorified shell script runner. Um, it's running these Docker commands. And that Docker push is going to push um, that new container image to the Docker registry, um, given a certain tag. I mean, we might as well use uh, 
the, uh, the SHA-1 hash of the commit, for example, as the tag. Um, and then, um, and so far, so good. Uh, the question is really, how do you then wire up the Kubernetes cluster? And there's a command called kubectl set image. And you can run this on, an, on a running uh, deployment um, of a container on a cluster. And, um, and what it does is it, you, you tell it, um, for this container image, um, uh, sorry, for this deployment which is running, uh, set it to use this specific container image. Um, and okay, so so far so good. Like what we've done here. Um, oh, oh, and by the way, then the Kubernetes cluster will pull that specific tag of that uh, of that container image down from the Docker registry, and and it will run it. Um, so so far so good. Um, but what we've done here, if you notice, is that we've tightly coupled the version of the code that's at master at head in the version control system with the a version of the code that's running in production in the Kubernetes cluster. Um, and that means that if we want to, for some reason, roll back the version that's running in the Kubernetes cluster in production, um, then we have to push a change all the way through the system. So we'd have to type something like git checkout master, git revert head, which makes a new commit, which has the reverse of what the last commit was. Um, and then uh, the developer would, would run git push. The CI system would build um, a new version. And that would get pushed to the Docker registry. And the Kubernetes cluster would then pull it down um, using this kubectl set image command. Um, the problem with this is that um, it is extremely um, slow. So basically, when, when you're doing a rollback, you're probably doing a rollback because something went wrong. And if something went, something went wrong, you want to fix it as quickly as you possibly can. Um, but building uh, container images uh, from code can sometimes be slow, depending on what kind of language it is. If it's like a Node.js application, it might need to pull in lots of modules. It might take a long time. Um, if, it's, uh, if it's a big image that gets the results from that, then pushing it to the container registry can be slow. And, um, uh, and then running it in the Kubernetes cluster requires pulling it down from the container image. So you're pushing potentially hundreds of megabytes around and waiting for like slow CPU bound um, build systems uh, before, you can, before you can undo your change. So, so I think that's a bit of a downside. Um, but nevertheless, um, I'm going to, uh, to attempt to demonstrate this, uh, this example using a system which I've just been told might not work. Um, so uh, please forgive me if it doesn't work. So um, let me see. So if we go back here. Um, so what I've got here is um, uh, I've got an application that's called the Sock Shop. Um, that's uh, that's running here, um, and it uh, allows you to buy socks on the internet. It's a microservices app, um, and um, we're going to try and make a change. We're going to try and push that change through the system. But before we do, um, we've also got a an instance of GitLab running here, and you can see the front end code is is here, um, and uh, the front end code um, is. Uh, in um, here, I guess, like the it's a bunch of JavaScript, basically. Um, and um, there's also some, some HTML and some CSS in here. Um, and so let's, let's um, configure the GitLab CI so that it um, can automatically do that kubectl set image. So what we already have here is we have these stages uh, in, this, in this GitLab environment. Uh, if you're not familiar with this uh, GitLab CI uh, YAML file, it's just the instructions that um, the CI system is meant to run at various different stages. Uh, it's quite a nice system. Um, and it has this build stage and, and, a, and a push stage. Um, and so the build stage uh, does the Docker build, and the push stage does the Docker push. Uh, and so that's fine. And does the Docker push uh, to the registry that comes out of the box uh, with, with GitLab? Um, but what we additionally need to do uh, in our v1 
is this kubectl set image piece. And the kubectl set image piece looks a little bit like this. Um, so um, we're doing kubectl set image with a namespace sock shop of the deployment front end. Um, and we're setting the container image to front end equals image name, image tag. Um, and so what we should see now um, is that when we do a new commit and we push that new commit um, into, uh, into, the, um, into the GitLab environment, uh, then we should see the pipeline is running. OK. Um, and um, then it updated the, uh, the image. So, so that seemed to work. But now we haven't actually made a change yet. We haven't actually changed the app. We've just changed the CI configuration. Um, if we go here and look, then, then yeah, the app is, is still up and running. Um, but we've wired it up in the simplest possible way. Now, um, if I make a change, uh, I'm going to make a change to change the color of the buttons from, uh, from blue to red. Um, so uh, that's just by using said. I could, probably would have been better to use a text editor, but um, this was easier to script. But I'm, I'm changing the color of the buttons in the CSS file uh, from, uh, from blue to red. This is a bluish color. That's a reddish color. Um, and then we're going to do a git push. And um, so that git push should have automatically resulted in, uh, in the, Kubernet in the uh, GitLab environment uh, let's look at the pipelines. Yep, changing the color of the button from blue to red. Uh, build production, push production. Let's see about push production. OK, so that did indeed update that image. And now if we go back to uh, the sock shop, uh, it looks like it's probably pulling down that image. Oh, there we go. OK, so we've got red buttons. Um, so like I said, I mean, this was a simple example. It, it didn't actually take very long. Um, to, uh, to, to do, but um, we now have tightly coupled master at head in, um, in the source code repository with, uh, with the Kubernetes cluster, with the state of the Kubernetes cluster. OK, cool. So the demo worked. That was a nice surprise. Um, I've got two more to go, though, so I can't guarantee they'll all work. Can you a good time for a quick question? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, we have a question saying, will you be talking about utilizing Helm for CI CD processes, or how do you recommend working and testing with all dependencies? What if my environment consists of uh, DB plus caching layer plus static NFS path that needs to be mounted, et cetera? Is that so really, something for Yeah. Um, so that's a really interesting question. Um, I. I'm not going to be talking about using Helm in this talk, but we are working on making Helm work with Flux, which is the tool that we've developed um, that I'm going to um, uh, uh, that I'm going to be introducing later. Um, so um, yeah, and I'd be very interested in, in, and I know my colleagues will be very interested in talking to you uh, potentially separately about how you're using Helm and. Um, uh, and, and whether we can help. <laughs> so uh, feel free to reach out, uh, come and join our Slack channel, um, um, Alexi, um, and uh, it would be, be good, good to chat more later. OK, um, cool. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'm now going to talk about the downsides to the sort of V1 design. Um, so one downside, like I said, building and pushing containers is slow. It takes up disk I.O. It takes up network. Ideally, we wouldn't have to do that when we were rolling back. Um, and it also means that um, how, like, so how are we going to have multiple environments? We probably don't, if we want to have a staging cluster and a production cluster, probably don't actually want to promote everything that's running in staging up to the production cluster every single time. Um, uh, every single time you do a release, it makes sense to be able to have the production cluster running on a on a different version than master at head um, for each microservice. And the naive way to solve that then would be to say, well, each there should be a branch per microservice in the source code repo, 
um, that corresponds to each environment. But then you're mixing up um, feature branches with environment branches, and it's only a matter of time until you get a git merge mess. Um, I've been there. Um, so it's better to sort of try and decouple the version of the code at head from the version that's deployed in different environments. Um, so, so that's, that's sort of the, the argument I'm going to make. Um, there's also an argument um, for putting all the config, all the Kubernetes YAML, um, in one place. So rather than having your user service have a Kubernetes YAML manifest uh, for that user service, um, and uh, then having a config repo, sorry, um, and, and then having another, like the orders service, having its Kubernetes YAML in, in a different place. Um, this, if you, if you follow this model, then it makes it hard to recover if something goes wrong, because you don't ever have one place that you can point to that says, that is the source of truth for what's running in my cluster. Um, and, um, and the problem uh, with that is if you, for example, were to lose your cluster, um, if it were to, um, if an asteroid were to hit it, for example, um, then uh, it would be difficult to um, uh, to recover that cluster completely, um, because maybe you have a hundred different uh, repos on on GitLab. Um, maybe some of them were deployed, some of them weren't. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's therefore valuable to have a central source of truth for your entire application that's made up of micro, multiple microservices and put all the YAML files uh, for, for that application in one place. Um, so similarly, um, it's valuable to um, decouple the versions of things um, from, from what's running in different environments. Um, like I said earlier, you don't end up with feature branches and uh, and environments um, sort of sitting side by side um, in uh, in in each of the um, in each of the uh, repos for each of your microservices. So I found this picture on the internet of uh, camels in one place. It's actually surprisingly hard to do because normally on the internet you find pictures of camels like roaming on their own. Um, or in ones and twos, but um, I chose camels because it rhymes with yamels, and that's how it weave works. We pronounce yaml files. Um, so the idea is, if you put all your yaml files in one place, then you get this nice sort of centralized source of truth, um, and and that's cool because it means that if your cluster explodes, uh, then you can recover. Uh, you can just reapply all the yaml that is in that one central repo at a certain revision. Um, and you know that that's how your cluster was at that previous point in time. Um, so if we if we want to try and update the uh, the v the v one architecture so that it has this uh, centralized source of truth, which is this version controlled config repo, then it is possible to do it in this way. Um, it's um, the idea is that you basically make the CI system do the work, and this is the the, the v two option. Um, and you basically say, if, if I have a change in my code um, that results in a new container image being built in by, by the CI system, the container image can get pushed to the container registry. And then the CI system can additionally, after that point, check out the version of the code that's currently in the config repo, modify it, push it back to the config repo, and then push that config to the Kubernetes cluster, at which point the Kubernetes cluster will download the config uh, sorry, download the Docker image from the Docker registry. Um, so, OK, uh, sounds a bit complicated. Um, but hopefully, I convinced you that having all your YAML files in a central repo is valuable because it acts as a source of truth. So in that case, um, how, how can we actually um, go ahead and do that? Um, well, one way that you can do it um, is, uh, is by putting some lines in your uh, GitLab uh, config. Um, oh, and I have a question here. Um, is Weave Scope a free tool or a paid service? Does it require WeaveNet, uh, or does it work with network drivers like Calico and Flannel? Um, so Weave Scope um, is open source, um, and it doesn't require WeaveNet. They are um, 
they do not have a, a hard dependency on each other. So yeah, you can use Weave Scope with um, with any uh, container network, but um, we also offer a hosted version of Scope and Flux, which is what I'm talking about here, and also a project called Cortex, which is a monitoring solution, which um, are available as a SaaS product in Weave Cloud, which I'll, I'll show you a little bit of later. Um, and this isn't free. This is $30 per server per month. Um, but uh, yeah, the explore part of Weave Cloud uses Scope, and Scope is also available as an open source project. Um, but I haven't configured it in this, in this example. OK, uh, cool. So um, I'll just go back to uh, how we, um, just going to delete that slide. Um, I'm going to go back to how we uh, do this sort of V2 architecture. Um, the, the, the benefit of the V2 architecture is that we want, the, the benefit we want to get is that we can recreate our production environment uh, if the production cluster gets deleted. Um, and so the way that uh, we are going to do that um, is by putting our uh, change back. So we're going to go back. Um, we're going to revert that last change. Um, and then I'm going to go in and we're going to change the Kubernetes, uh, sorry, the GitLab config. Um, so I'm going to delete this line, which is the line I had before. And then I'm going to put a bunch of lines in here. And I'm going to show you uh, what each of them does in a second. Um, but first, I'm just going to format them properly. Um, Oh no, I have tabs. Sorry. Um, I obviously didn't configure the Vim that I way, uh, configure Vim the way that I like to use it normally. Um, uh, so okay, so what, what what are we doing here? We're doing a bunch of different things. Um, so the first thing that we're doing. Um, is that we're doing the, the Docker push. That's what we did before. Uh, then we're going to CD into slash temp. Uh, we're going to delete um, the microservices demo uh, repo if it was there before. Uh, then we're going to try and uh, clone it. Um, and then um, we're going to use uh, kubectl set image with this dash dash local flag and minus o yaml. Um, to modify in place the Kubernetes YAML um, that, that we've got here. We're then going to um, copy that temporary file over the top of um, uh, the manifest that we want to update. And um, then we're going to configure Git, because we're going to be pushing automatically as Git in this scenario, because remember, what we said was that we were going to get the CI system to update the version controlled config. Um, and then uh, we're going to commit um, and push. Um, and then we're going to use kubectl apply to apply the uh, manifest that we, just, uh, that we just modified. So let's see if that works. Um, I'm going to first start by sort of just flushing that change through the system. Um, Let's go and see how it feels about this. So it's running this push here. OK, uh, yeah, so I guess this is the way in which the demo is broken. So apologies for that. Um, the, um, so what failed here was that it tried to check out this uh, microservices demo.git repo. Uh, that isn't in here for some reason. It was last time I was here. Um, but uh, if we look at, um, I'll show you what was meant to be in that repo. Um, basically, what was meant to be in that repo was these uh, Kubernetes manifests here. Um, and one of those Kubernetes manifests is the manifest for the front end. Um, and the manifest for the front end uh, refers to a specific uh, version of the front end service, and so the idea here was that this um, uh, is is that this um, this script that we wrote was supposed to um, automatically update that manifest 
and push it back to the source of truth and also um, update the cluster with it. So um, unfortunately, that didn't really work. Um, but if we just imagine that it worked um, for a second, um, let's think about the downsides that we would hypothetically have had. Um, the, 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 the problem, one of the problems I have with this is that uh, the CI system is starting to become responsible for a lot of different stuff. Um, and if I was an architect, I would say that that would kind of makes me think um, that it smells a bit funny. It's like a design smell. The CI system ends up being responsible for doing more than one thing well. Uh, and a little bit like microservices, it's best if everything in your, uh, in your DevOps architecture can do one thing well. Uh, you can also only still, you can still only trigger the CI system by pushing code. Now remember one of the downsides I referred to earlier from the V1 was that you wanted to be able to roll back without pushing code. And if you roll back out of band, um, either directly uh, with kubectl um, or uh, with, the, with some other tool to, to modify your Kubernetes config, then you need to remember to update the central configuration repo as well. Um, the problem here is that um, these, and, and, and so the, the problem with that is that we wanted to be able to very quickly roll back if something went wrong, um, but we were still stuck with having to wait for uh, slow container builds and, and pushes. So ideally, there would be a way of rolling back um, uh, without, um, without having to um, uh, rebuild container images. There's also a problem which is a bit more subtle, uh, which is that parallel builds can tread on each other's toes. It's not atomic. There isn't a lock anywhere in this system that we just designed. Um, and so if there are two jobs in CI that are running at the same time that both check out the config repo, both make incompatible changes to it, both commit them and push them back to the repo, then one of them is going to fail. Um, and that's not very good for automation. You don't want to have to be trying to automatically deal with merge conflicts. Um, also, I wasn't able to show you, but the updates that you get to the YAML files here um, don't look very good. Um, in particular, the kubectl set image command adds a bunch of stuff to your YAML files that maybe you didn't want there. Um, I think from memory, it just adds the defaults uh, for whatever that version of kube, kubectl was. Um, and you might just want to keep your, your Kubernetes YAMLs cleaner. You, you only want a system to automatically update just the version tag and nothing else. Um, and then additionally, your developers might start asking for more release management features. So you might want rollback. Like I said, we already said we wanted that. We might want to be able to pin certain versions. We might want to be able to have different policies for different environments, like manually um, deploy things in one in one environment and um, sorry, automatically deploy things in one environment and manually deploy them in another. And then this simple script, which is already kind of ugly and complicated, it gets more and more complicated. So the argument that I'm going to make, yeah, sorry, we do have a couple of questions that we could oh, cool. interject here. Um, earlier was, uh, won't this approach trigger an infinite loop of CI cycles because of the YAML commit and push? Uh, good question. Um, so the, um, so if the YAML files are stored, um, in the same repo that your version control code is stored in, then yes. It would. Um, but uh, what we're trying to do here is split that uh, config out into a separate um, environment, uh, split the config out into, uh, uh, sorry, into a separate repo. So, um, so that's something I've introduced in, in, in here. Um, and that's the, the repo that I was showing you on GitHub earlier. Um, so um, yeah, there's no infinite loop here, fortunately. Um, but uh, yeah, if you were to store the version control config, um, in the same repo as like your user service and your other microservices, then, then yeah, that could cause an infinite loop. Um, and then we have another one. Is it a best practice to have one Kubernetes cluster for dev and another separate cluster for production instead of namespaces? And what about multi-region Kubernetes clusters? Do they need to be separate as well? Great questions. I could do a whole talk on Kubernetes Federation. Yeah, um, <laughs> So um, it, best practice, um, 
I'm not sure what best practice is. I know that we have one Kubernetes cluster for dev and another one for production. Um, this is kind of a broader question about like how do clusters and environments map onto each other? Because you also talk about multi-region Kubernetes clusters. So there's no such thing as a multi-region Kubernetes cluster. Um, Kubernetes clusters run in, uh, or at least the advice is that you run a Kubernetes cluster in one place only, in one data center, or even one zone. Um, but if you want to feel like you have multiple a multi-region Kubernetes cluster, there's a project called Kubernetes Federation, which brings in a federated API server that you can run in one place that uh, exposes something that looks like um, a uh, just a single Kubernetes cluster, but is actually spanning multiple different uh, regions or zones. And and so what I was saying about like this mapping between environments and uh, and clusters is non-trivial. Because yes, you could have a Kubernetes cluster that has both your prod and your dev workloads in it. Or you could have uh, a production cluster that's actually multiple production clusters with Kubernetes federation. So there isn't a one-to-one -one mapping between environments and clusters. Um, and I think that's OK. Um, it's, it's just sort of a, a, a subtlety that's worth bearing in mind. Um, I would say that in terms of best practice at Weaveworks, we use separate clusters. Um, I think the idea there is just that, like, however good container isolation is, there's a chance that you're somehow going to hose the machines with some issue or some something you did in dev, and it would be great if you didn't hose all of the machines in production. Um, but then it depends, I guess, um, on how much you trust the the workloads that are running on these environments. Um, so, uh, Alexi, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, has asked another question. If you have one Kubernetes cluster for dev and one for prod, how do you use it with GitLab? Do you have project settings and integrations configured for dev Kubernetes and multiple secure pipeline variables for production Kubernetes access keys? Um, so um, what, I sh what I should be able to show you is how we recommend doing this um, with the tool that we've developed called Flux. Uh, which is where if you have multiple Kubernetes clusters, each Kubernetes cluster can have a Flux agent running on it. And that Flux agent can be configured to uh, go and talk to the version control system. So you can have basically multiple instances of uh, deployment manager. Um, but um, before I talk about that, I'm going to talk about why you want to do that. So um, let me now make the case for uh, a release manager or a deployment manager. Some people call it a deployment manager. Um, so the, the V3 architecture that I'm proposing here um, is, let's just compare it to the V2 architecture. So the V2 architecture here has a version, version control config sort of as the central thing, but the CI system is doing all the work of pushing and pulling to and from that config. Um, the, the architecture I'm now proposing is that we have an explicit runtime component called the release manager that is sitting there running all the time. Um, and the release manager is listening out for new container images showing up. And then when new container images show up, it will uh, do this read, modify, write loop on the version controlled config, which is the same thing we were asking the CI system to do earlier. Um, and then when the release manager is done, it can push that config to the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so let's take a look at a change that flows through the system now. So we have a change to the version control code um, that gets pushed as a container image. Um, sorry, that the CI system then builds and pushes a container image, uh, which gets pushed to a Docker registry. Docker registry now, by the way, notice has the old one and the new one, uh, which it always did before. Um, but we're now going to take advantage of the fact um, that there's an old one and a new one. I'll get to that, get onto that in a minute. Um, the Docker registry um, then, uh, well, the release manager then notices um, that the Docker registry has been modified. Uh, it does the thing, checking out the version of the config, modifying the config, and pushing it back. And then it pushes the config to the Kubernetes cluster, which pulls the image down uh, from the Docker registry. Um, so one of the really nice things about this architecture is that now when we want to do a rollback, the rollback doesn't have to go through the uh, through the CI system, and the rollback doesn't have to be um, a um, it doesn't have to be a code change. So we don't have to build and push uh, and pull container images anymore. So we can now instead the user can go and talk to the release manager and say like roll me back to the previous version. And now the release manager can check out the uh, new version of the config, update it so that it actually looks like the old version did. 
push that back to the source of truth, uh, push that to the Kubernetes cluster, and at which point the Kubernetes cluster will pull uh, the old image that it had, but actually it probably won't even need to pull it because it will already have it cached. And so this makes rollbacks much, much faster than they were, and that solves one of the big pain points that we had before. Um, and, um, and it also takes work away from the CI system. It, it means that you don't have to maintain those crummy little, those sort of cruddy little scripts that, uh, that I was showing you earlier that, are, that look ugly, they're difficult to maintain, and it's difficult to add features when it's all just like shell scripts running in a CI system. It's nicer actually to have an explicit component called the release manager that can do this work. Um, yeah, so I already said this, uh, the release manager watches for changes to the container registry. Um, it makes commits for you uh, to that version control config. And then depending on release policy, which can be configured per environment, it either pushes changes continuously or it can allow these sort of manually gated releases. So it can say, um, uh, manually promote this version to production. You can roll back releases um, really just by changing a pointer in a config file. And releases can also be locked. Um, and, and so this also means that different environments can now have different release policies. Um, so there's no more tight coupling between individual microservice repos um, and like what's at master ahead there and what's actually running in different environments. Um, and, uh, and that's also a nice thing. Um, so um, I've been told that I can attempt a demo um, on the uh, version of this on our website. So I'm crossing my fingers and my toes. And uh, you can come and play with these yourselves later, if you like. Um, there is the uh, intermediate, the beginner, um, continuous delivery with Flux, uh, interactive lab, which is available here. Um, so I'm going to give this a go. So um, I've got a Weave Cloud environment here. Weave Cloud has Flux uh, embedded as part of it, by the way. Um, and uh, I've just configured it with a, a token, which is the access, which is like an access key, an API key. Um, then I can type kubectl get nodes. I can see I've got a cluster of uh, two nodes running. Um, I'm going to deploy the same sample application that we saw earlier, and I'm going to check. Uh, that it's running. Um, that was actually a trick because it was running before. That's why it's already up and running and doesn't take a few minutes to, to start up. Um, and uh, we can now deploy um, the Weave Flux agent uh, to this cluster. And we can see that it's up and running. Uh, we can then configure um, the Flux environment. Now let me just show you what's in that file. Um, the configuration here is uh, the Git repo and the registry um, credentials, um, which it needs to be able to talk to. Um, and then we can do a command like fluxctl list images. And we can see that uh, Flux currently knows that the front end is running on this latest tag. Now we can also see um, in, uh, in Weave Cloud, if I come here, um, then hopefully, uh, it will show up in the deploy tab, but uh, that doesn't seem to be working. So, oh no, it's working now. Hooray, I just need to be patient. Um, so the front end um, is visible uh, here. And so what this, uh, this is basically the, inter the interface of the release manager that I'm proposing that you consider having in your continuous delivery pipeline. Um, the um, the release manager shows you what's running in the cluster. That's uh, this thing here on the left. It shows you, uh, when you click on one of the sort of microservices that's running in the cluster, it allows you to see all the different tags for that container image. Um, and uh, it then allows you to do releases, so switching between different tags. Um, so I haven't actually got any other tags. Um, but what I can do is uh, change the color of the buttons from blue to red. Um, and if I now go into my GitLab environment, which is running here, and I go and look at the uh, microservices, uh, no, uh, the front end pipeline, 
then that pipeline is running at the moment. So that's changing the color of the buttons from blue to red. And you can see that now all, of the, all that this is doing is doing a push. Um, it's not doing any of that other complicated work because it's now no longer the responsibility of the CI system to do that, the job of releasing changes to Kubernetes. Um, but uh, what we can do now um, is we can go into Weave Cloud. Um, and if I hit reload and cross my fingers again, yay, I've got the new version. So that new version is the version with red buttons. Um, and I can click release on that version. And then uh, Flux or uh, Weave Cloud Deploy um, is going to do a dry run. So it's going to tell me what it plans to do. Uh, then I'm going to click the release button. Um, and that's going to actually do the release. Um, and there's two words that show up here that I'm going to draw your attention to. Um, pushing changes and applying changes. Hopefully, you can see that text on my screen. So pushing changes corresponds to uh, when it's changing the, um, uh, the Kubernetes YAML. And applying changes corresponds to when it's applying that modified Kubernetes YAML, which is the configuration for the application, applying those changes to the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so if we go back here, no, not that one. That was the one that went wrong. Uh, if we go back here, uh, we can also go and look at that centralized uh, config repo, this microservices demo repo here. And we see there's a new commit. So this is what the, uh, uh, the deployment manager or the release manager um, is doing. It's only changing just the part of that config that you need uh, to update it from latest to that specific named version um, of the container image. Um, and now if I go back to the sock shop, um, then I can see I've got red buttons. Uh, so that's great. That worked. And if I wanted to, I could also go back to Weave Cloud, um, and I could roll back to the old version. I could also automate it. Now, what automation, um, and sorry, when I did the, when the, if I was to do the rollback, uh, then that would go through really, really quickly because um, I would not be, I would just be changing the pointer and all the container images would already be cached. So we don't have to modify the source code again to change what's running. I can also turn on automation. Now, this really is continuous delivery because now for this environment, the CD demo environment, which could be a staging cluster or it could be a production cluster, I have um, every time a new container image hits the registry, I'm automatically going to deploy that new container image in, into, into the environment. Um, and then I can also, if I want to, lock the releases so that it um, doesn't do any automatic releases. Uh, and if I were to de-automate and roll back, um, then, uh, for example, I could um, sorry, unlock. I could roll back and then lock it to that previous version. And really, that is just a social cue to say, um, there's something wrong with this service. Please go and talk to someone else before you update it. Um, and so that's it, really. Um, that is um, the release manager uh, that we are proposing. It's called Flux. Uh, it's available on GitHub. Um, it's also available as part of Weave Cloud, uh, which is our SaaS service. Uh, if you're interested in Flux on GitHub, it's uh, github.com slash weavework slash Flux. Um, there's actually a really cool new version um, which has a beta release, uh, I believe. Uh, yeah, it's pre-release. It's the 1.0.0 beta um, that adds a new idea called GitOps, uh, which hopefully we're going to be doing talks about GitOps in the future on the Weave Online User Group uh, because it's a really cool um, sort of new idea um, that all of your operational changes should be made as pull requests to this uh, version-controlled uh, config repo. Um, but go and check this out. Um, there's also uh, some, some good documentation uh, here um, on GitHub for, uh, for example, um, uh, if you want to run it as a standalone thing, for example, um, then it gives you um, information on, on how to do that. Um, and I'm almost out of time. So um, it, that is the demo. Um, I will say a few words about uh, Weave Cloud as well, which is our product. Um, so we use uh, Weave Cloud to deploy Weave Cloud. Uh, we use Flux um, uh, as the deployment manager tool that uh, we use to update uh, um, ship updates to our own software. 
Um, and we developed it because of the lessons that we learned uh, while um, doing that wrong a few times and then figuring out how to do it properly, which hopefully I've captured in this talk. Um, and Weave Cloud is a product which helps you go around this loop faster. So this deploy feature is just one of them. Um, we also have a bunch of observability tools like this explore and monitor tool, uh, which help you see problems in production and react faster so that you can get changes and fixes back into, uh, into production as quickly as possible and basically go around this loop and uh, be a highly productive software team um, using our product. So are there any questions I can answer quickly or? I think we have 30 seconds left. Would you have the final slide with the Slack uh, link? If not, I have it. There it is. Um, yes. Yes. So if any of you have not joined our Slack channel, um, please go to our help page, and it will have instructions to invite yourself. And our team is pretty much there almost 24-7. And we're definitely happy to help and answer any questions. Um, and some people asked, we are recording this, so um, you'll get an email after this event um, with a link to this video. Yeah, come and join us. Come and chat with us. Ask us more questions on, on Slack, please. And uh, thanks for coming today. Thank you. Thanks for joining, and thanks for all your great questions. See you next time. Bye-bye.